Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Today in the show, we're going to talk a little about how to get the best weed control when the weather conditions are adverse. What happens when it's hot and dry? What happens when it's way too cold? Maybe it's super wet out. How do you stop the weeds then? We'll discuss it today. We'll also look at tree and shelter belt management. We've got a lot of issues that happen out in tree belts. We get many questions throughout the season. We'll tackle some of those today. We've got an iron talk coming up later in the show and a weed of the week as well. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the Enzone Fan Control System from Farm Shop MFG. The Enzone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk about a hot topic in the United States, nitrate and water quality. When you think about crops like corn, for example, you look at all the nutrients that need to go onto that crop to feed it, to make it through the season. Well, one of the important ones is nitrogen. And as farmers are putting nitrogen out on crops, they're carefully managing it in several different ways. First of all, they'll do soil tests up front to see, is there any nitrogen left from last year's crop? Then they'll determine how much nitrogen this year's crop is going to need. And then many farmers now are going to the strategy of putting on a little bit of nitrogen in the spring and a little bit more nitrogen in the middle of the season. So they're split applying that nitrogen. One of the reasons why is that nitrogen eventually can convert to the nitrate form, which has a negative charge and can leach down through the soil. So farmers are trying to prevent that leaching because nitrogen is expensive and their crop needs a lot of it. Soil also has a negative charge and that's why we have this issue. So ideally as farmers, we're trying to keep nitrogen in the ammonium form. If it's in the ammonium form, that's positively charged. That will bind with the negatively charged soil. Once it gets into that nitrate form, that's where we really worry about that loss. So a lot of advisors to us as farmers have said, well, just put a little bit on at a time. And that's all great to say. But what happens when you're a dry land farmer like we are, we barely get rain some years. You can't take that risk. You've got to put some more nitrogen out up front because here's the worst case scenario. If a farmer doesn't put enough nitrogen on to get that crop going, then the crop ends up being terrible, then it doesn't use nitrogen that comes available out of the soil later in the season. There have been a lot of studies done on this. Out of organic matter in soil, that soil will naturally release nitrogen all throughout the growing season. If there isn't significant crop there to use up that nitrogen, well, that's where a lot of nitrate leaching can occur. Now, a lot of people also will blame drain tile that, oh, drain tile's leading to lots of issues. Look, drain tile absolutely reduces total total nitrogen lost from fields. It reduces significantly phosphorus, potassium, all these other nutrients. It very much reduces loss. But the one form of nitrogen we worry about losing is nitrate. So for farmers, they can do a number of things. I already mentioned split applying the nitrogen, putting some out at different times through the season, testing the soil, testing that crop to see exactly how much nitrogen they're going to need. But another thing they can do is they can also put on stabilized forms of nitrogen or add a stabilizer to yep. virtually any form of nitrogen. So what Brian was talking about earlier, trying to keep that nitrogen with a positive charge as long as they possibly can out in the field, that can certainly help to reduce loss. Yep, so for me as a dry land farmer, I can go put my nitrogen on early with a stabilizer that gives me much greater chance to keep it in the ammonium form. Now, here's the last thing we wanna leave you with and probably the most important thing we'll leave you with today. Please understand that there is nitrate in all water. It's okay, don't panic. The drinking water standard for nitrate nitrogen is 10 parts per million. So we would really encourage you whenever you hear some story in the news or somebody's talking negative about farmers and oh, they're polluting with all this nitrogen. How many farmers have you ever met that want to waste money? Yeah, that's really what I'd like to do. I'm gonna spend $100,000 on nitrogen and I just want all of it to go into the water. No way, no farmer ever dreams about anything like that. We as farmers are trying to protect the nitrogen, keep it in our fields, use it. So what I'd encourage you to do is go out and test your water. We've done a whole bunch of that and you know what we find? Farmers aren't polluting stuff. Where we see most of the pollution, where most of the nitrate is, 
coming out of cities. And if you don't believe that, just go test some water upstream and downstream out of any city in the country and you will see exactly what I'm talking about. But again, nitrate nitrogen, 10 parts per million, that's a drinking water standard. As long as you're below that, we're all good. Well, we don't want to see a high level of nitrogen in the water. We also don't want to see a high level of weed pressure out in our fields. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. Pentair Hypro Ultra Low Drift Nozzles are your ideal choice for the Enlist E3 herbicide system. With coverage comparable to flat fans and with 90% less drift, ULD nozzles meet all required standards for Enlist applications and provide optimal performance of contact herbicides. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming, and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at AgBiome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions. Microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. AgBiome, feeding the world responsibly. Partnering with microbes for human benefit. Where we have run the Soil Warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. Now, I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. Their ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the Soil Warrior. Engineered to be the most advanced concave system available, the XBR system threshes all crops, reduces grain loss, and significantly improves grain quality and storability. Probably the biggest difference that we noticed right away was the grain quality. The sample was much better. With this XBR system, now we've cut down rotor loss significantly. I can switch out a two pound cover plate in just a few minutes and jump to about 30% more on our capacity. Visit EstesPerformanceConcaves.com. Throughout the year, Darren and I get a lot of questions about how do we control weeds when the weather's adverse? Because one of the things we talk about all the time is you can get better and easier weed control when the weather's great. When it's warm, not hot, but warm and humid, and it has been for several days, and then it's warm and humid afterwards, and we have great subsoil moisture. Well, what that means is for a lot of these herbicides, when the weed's actively growing, you can get more into the plant, and then it moves easier to the growing point. Weed dies faster, you get better overall weed control. So how does this work when the weather's adverse? Well, first of all, let's look at conditions that make it really tough for farmers to spray their weeds. One would be wind. Well, in this year, we saw some of the windiest conditions that we've ever seen. In fact, we were five to 10 miles per hour above normal for wind speed during one of the major times that farmers are out trying to spray in our region. Now, when you get windy days, you just can't spray. What farmers will do then when they know they've got a windy week and they really need to get some spraying done is they will just be ready. Farmers will have product on hand. They will have their sprayers loaded up with water where all they've got to do is add in that product or they'll watch that weather hour by hour to find, hey, here's a two hour window on Tuesday that I can spray. They'll be ready to go so they can hit the ground running and get as much product out there in those windy times as they can. All right, when it's hot and dry, what happens with weeds, just like all plants, they develop a thicker leaf cuticle. The reason why they do that is if it's too dry out in the air, plants are always kicking moisture out, pulling moisture back in. Well, if they can't get the moisture back in, that's not a good thing. So as a defense mechanism, the plant gets basically a thicker wax on it. Well, the problem with that is you gotta get the herbicide through that wax and into the plant. So what you can do as a farmer is use something like methylated seed oil or crop oil, or even bump those rates if you want to. Those are designed to help bust through, to help penetrate through that wax and deliver your herbicide into the plant. 
Well, let's take the opposite conditions. Let's say it's too cold because every spring we talk to farmers that say, you know what, it's just been too cold. My weeds aren't actively growing. If you don't have actively growing weeds, it's going to be very difficult to use a product to kill them. But then think about it this way. If weeds aren't actively growing, does it really matter if you wait a few days then? They aren't any bigger when you go out a few days later. So being patient sometimes is the right answer in order to get better weed control. Otherwise, what we would suggest is upping the rate. Roundup, for example, will tell you if the nighttime temperature is below 50 degrees within two days before or after spraying, you need to increase your rate by 50% as long as that's still on label. So you can overcome cold weather by bumping the rate of the herbicide. Let's talk about too wet as well. This is another issue that farmers will run into from time to time. They're all ready to go and spray and they get a two inch rain. Now the soils may not be super saturated and waterlogged, but it's just too muddy to drive a ground rig through the field. For these reasons and others, you may see aerial application being done, whether it's a helicopter or a plane flying over the field. Obviously you aren't going to create any ruts through that mud when you're flying over the top, but you can still get your product sprayed timely this way. The last thing I wanted to bring up is rain fast times. Now on the label of most herbicides, it will tell you this is rain fast in 30 minutes or 60 minutes or two hours, whatever it is. But just as a general rule, we've always found that once the product dries onto the plant, we're in good shape. Okay, so you got to pay attention to when's the rain coming, but the other thing you have to pay attention to is dew. What we found is if you spray later on in the evening, dew starts forming, and when that dew forms, there's so much moisture there, it doesn't allow that herbicide to get down into the plant. So what I'm saying is now you've basically extended your rain fast time. Instead of, oh, it's going to dry out of that plant in 30 minutes like it might if, let's say, you were spraying at 11 o'clock in the morning, now it might take six hours or 10 hours before that herbicide fully gets down into that plant. So just make sure that you are paying attention to when's the rain coming and how much dew is there going to be tonight. And ideally you would have perfect weather when you're out trying to control our weed of the week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed later in the show. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. Hot spots and moisture in your bin can cost you thousands in lost revenue. The end zone monitors outside conditions to run your fans exactly when you want them to, naturally bringing your grain to ideal temperature and humidity. Master bin management with the end zone. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. Each year brings new and unique challenges to farming and your operation needs to constantly adapt to meet them. That's why at AgBiome, we're working every day to bring you new and better solutions, microbial-based solutions that protect your crop and help it reach its full potential. To learn more about how we're doing it, visit agbiome.com. AgBiome, feeding the world responsibly, partnering with microbes for human benefit. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line, then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. we wanted to talk a little about tree and shelter belt management. We'll discuss things like fertility, weed control, 
and insect control as well. First of all, it does make a difference if you've got a brand new shelter belt or if you have an established one with great big trees. Now, if you've got great big trees out there, chances are you probably already have some grass established in between the rows. If you've got grass established, that's fine. If you're going to mow that grass, that gives you some management options where, you know what, you could prevent weeds from going to seed just by mowing in many cases. If you're going to let the grass just grow tall and you're not going to try to mow in between the rows of trees, that could be a good way to go too. You want to make sure that you have a thick canopy of grass out there. This is going to be your best weed control option you've got. If that grass is thick and healthy, it's going to choke out weeds. In established shelter belts, what we usually talk about is go out there and spray 2,4-D. Now I'm talking the good new 2,4-Ds like Freelex or Enlist One, so you don't have all the volatility and drift. Preferably early in the spring, late in the fall, we worry about leaf drop, especially with the old 2,4-Ds. If you spray old 2,4-D in the middle of the summer, you're going to drop all the leaves off all your trees, so be careful not to do that. Now another thing that you could potentially use out there is a product called Tenacity. That's Mesotrione. In most shelter belts, that's going to be okay. But what you have to make sure you don't do is use something that will hurt your trees. Herbicides like Tordon, Milestone, Chaparral, you don't want to use those at all in your shelter belt. So be careful about which products you're using. The other thing is to be safe. If you can use a dry, that's great. If you're using a liquid, don't spray it on the leaves of the tree. Don't even spray it on the tree trunk if you can help it. Just try to avoid those things. And if you've got some real sensitive species out there, I've seen some people, including myself, even hold a piece of cardboard along the side where I'm going to spray just to make sure it doesn't get too far or too close to a tree. Okay, so stepping back, let's say you're creating a new shelter belt. What we would tell you is you can use Casseron, Princep, maybe even a trifluralin or pendimethalin, something like that. So it all depends on what trees you're going to be using, how you're going to be applying this, but there are products that can be used in between shelter belts. I would say in both established and new shelter belts, you can use Roundup if you're very, very careful to keep that off the trees. And we don't worry as much about the bark as we do the leaves. Keep it off the tree leaves. Otherwise, yeah, with the new shelter belts, there's an awful lot of hand weeding that ends up getting done. Now, I also want to say when we're talking about new shelter belts, this is your chance to make that shelter belt great. So we just started a new shelter belt a few years ago on our farm, and the number one thing you have to consider is how much potassium is in that soil. It's kind of like alfalfa in that, hey, this is a perennial crop, but this is a perennial crop for like 50 years or more. So you've got one chance to get your potassium, phosphorus, all those nutrients down deep in the ground and balanced well. Get that base saturation K up to 7 to 8 percent. Trust me, that will be huge in terms of your overall shelter belt health. You bring up the fertility topic, Brian, and this one is a little bit controversial because some people will say, well, you don't need to fertilize a tree belt at all. But then we talk to farmers who are raising nut crops, for example, and they say, you're crazy. You can make such a difference on the health of those trees, the longevity of that tree stand, everything with fertility out there. Why would you not do it? So during the life of that stand, well, I said you can't really do much with phosphorus and potassium. You could certainly do a little bit with potassium if you water it a lot and if you have light soil. But otherwise, there are lots of other nutrients that those trees need. They could use a little nitrogen. They could use some sulfur. They could use some boron. There are plenty of other nutrients. So just take a look at whatever type of tree you have, what its nutrient requirements are, and consider adding some fertility each and every year, and you will have a much healthier shelter belt. If you're concerned about the health of the trees in your tree grove or your shelter belt, one of the things that you have to look at as well is keeping bugs that are harmful out of those trees. Now, there's been much talk about emerald ash borer, for example, as being a big problem wherever you have ash trees, but there are other bugs out there that can be problematic for trees. You want to keep an eye on them and you want to work with a local arborist if you don't really know how to look for these things or where to find the different bugs that are in your area for your species of trees. But this may be something that you end up treating on an annual or semi-annual basis as well to keep those bugs out and keep your trees healthy. Well, it's not just bugs, Darren, it's mites as well. So in our shelter belts, we're spraying twice a year. We are using a miticide, if not two. We're using an insecticide, if not two. And we're also using a fungicide and maybe two or three fungicides. So we're hitting it with a bunch of stuff to control diseases, insects, and mites. Our shelter belt's a lot more healthy because we have treated the problem. 
We love trees and shelter belts and we want to keep them healthy so they can last and provide benefit for a long time. Keep an eye on the fertility in your tree and shelter belt, weed control, and certainly insects and mites and diseases too. And you can keep those trees healthy and enjoy them for a long time. Well, one of the things I never enjoy is seeing weeds out in my field. If you've got this tough weed, we'll show you how to stop it on your farm coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> looks a lot like water hemp or palmer pigweed, but fortunately it's not. It's just red root pigweed. Now, it's easy to tell the difference between the two. Basically, water hemp and palmer pigweed, they are hairless. But red root pigweed, you can tell that apart because it's got hair all over it. Well, the other thing about red root pigweed that's a little bit different is there's still a lot of herbicides that can control it, and that's a good thing because all the same herbicides that work for water hemp and palmer pigweed, yeah, they work for red root pigweed too, but there are some other options like Roundup, for example, yep. it still works great on red root pigweed. Yep, and not only that, a lot of the ALS herbicides will work okay on it. So if you take that into account, you go, well, why are you guys even talking about red root pigweed if it's so easy to kill? Well, we are because we still find red root pigweed all over the place. So we wanted to talk today about what are your best options in corn, soybeans, and wheat. In soybeans, for example, our three pre strategy works fantastic on small seeded broadleaves like red root pigweed. Use one of the yellows like Treflan or Prowl, use Metribuzin, and then use Valor or Authority. And if you do that, you probably won't see many pigweeds come through. Post emerge, you should be able to control red root pigweed just fine with Enlist One, with any of the dicamba products on Extend crops. You've got Liberty, you've got Roundup. So there are lots of options in all the traded crops. Now, how about if you have, let's just say, conventional? soybeans. Now how do you control red root pigweed? Darren, what's your best shot? Well, what I would do is still use that three pre strategy. It's very important for any of the soybeans that you're going to be planting. Then in crop, think about a couple different things. One, you may want to use some warrant or a similar product, a group, a group 15. 15 herbicide to extend your residual window. Use that with your first post-emerge pass, which should occur about 28 days after your planting. Now, maybe, may, maybe it earlier. It may vary than a little that, bit yes. depending on what your growing because conditions are. They don't kill any, any weeds that have emerged. You have to have the group 15 on before the weeds emerge. That's true. And you also want to put it out with something that's going to kill any pigweeds that are already up. And what would something, that be? Something like <laughs> Flexstar or Cobra yes. would be good options, especially if you use them early. Now, if you said, I've used them late in the season and they were hit or miss, Yes, because you use them as a rescue product. They're designed as an early post-emerge product. That's where they work the best. And on Red Root Pigweed, you also have Pursuit and Raptor and a few other ALS products that'll have some activity on Red Root Pigweed, not so much on Water Hemp or Palmer. Okay, turning to corn, I would suggest starting with Verdict, follow post-emerge with Status or one of the HPPDs. If you can throw a little atrazine in, you're great. If I go to Wheat, then we're talking Sharpen, post-emerge, I'd probably pick Husky. That's all the time we have for this week's weed, Red Root Pigweed. But stay tuned because Iron Talk is coming up next. If you want unparalleled performance from your corn head, you need the Diamant from Capello USA. Fully hydraulic deck plates chop with speed and precision, and chain-free gearboxes make a quieter, more efficient machine. The Diamant's revolutionary quick-release snouts and bonnets prevent damage and make maintenance a breeze. And our folding option allows for clear visibility on roads, making travel between fields safe, quick, and easy. For more ways the Diamant can innovate your corn harvest, contact your Capello dealer today. Capello, wherever you are, we are. 
If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. How much money are you leaving in the bin? If you want the most profit from your stored grain, you need the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. This low cost bin monitoring solution tracks temperature and humidity and gets your grain in ideal condition. And with deep preseason discounts on all Grain Temp Guard units, now is the best time to upgrade. Don't leave your money out in the bin, get the most from your grain. Order today at farmshopmfg.com. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy. All the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line, then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Compaction is a big concern anytime you're driving in a field. In today's Iron Talk, we'll look at the debate of tires versus tracks and give you a few new thoughts to consider besides just compaction. Growing up on the farm, my dad's view was that he didn't want to invest too much in equipment, and when tracks came along, he was worried about how long it would take until he got his money back on that investment. Brian and I definitely agree with the idea that you do need to look at your return on investment with big decisions on the farm. How about with tracks and reducing compaction? First of all, if you're using tires, like we still do on some pieces of equipment, you have to be concerned with air pressure. On newer equipment, you can monitor the pressure from the cab, which is definitely helpful. However, it does take time to be constantly adjusting air pressure, and operating at low pressure often makes tractor performance worse. There are tire hop issues, and you've got to deal with weighting and ballasting too. One good thing about tracks is that they're balanced all the time, and only one front ballast weight is there just to balance out the tractor. Another consideration is maintenance. Tires go flat. Tracks do not. However, you do need some maintenance on the tracks too. Fortunately, now you have a remote hydraulic valve to automatically tension the track, and as far as oil changes for the roller wheels go, they're maintenance-free up to about 2,500 hours. If you have a lot of road time between fields, here's one place where tires shine versus tracks. The ride is much better, and you don't have to worry about heat buildup like you do with some tracks. There have been some advancements for tracks, though, such as roller wheel systems made of polyurethane to reduce heat buildup, and new undercarriage components that now allow road speeds of up to 25 miles per hour with road track tractors. There are plenty of pros and cons to tires versus tracks. The best way to make that call on your farm is to actually do some digging with a shovel out in the field, demo tracks if you haven't already done so, and talk to other farmers and dealers you trust to work through the numbers. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we'd like to invite you to check out the Ag PhD radio show where we take your live phone calls each weekday on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD. Yeah.